In the first episode, I talked about Raspberry Pi clusters and clusters in general, and how and why you might want to build one. I used as an example my Raspberry Pi Dramble cluster that I've been running for years. In the second episode, I showed you the Turing Pi cluster in the Raspberry Pi Compute module, and how to put an OS onto that Compute module. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to connect to the Raspberry Pis that you put into the Turing Pi, and then how to install Kubernetes onto them. When I flashed all of the Raspberry Pi compute modules in the last episode with Hyperiot OS, I also set the host names for them, and the host names will help me identify the new Raspberry Pis on my network using a utility called Network Mapper. Uh, after you plug in the Turing Pi the first time, or any Raspberry Pi that you just flashed, it usually takes a bit of time for it to fully boot up. Uh, because Hyperit or Raspbian or whatever OS you're using has to do a lot of housekeeping. It has to set the host name. It might have to expand the file system on your card to the full size so that you get the full disk capacity. And uh, usually that requires a reboot of it after it does that. And so it could take a minute or two at least before everything shows up on your network. Uh, but I'm going to use the network map utility, or nmap, uh, to find every device on my network. And I'm going to search in that list for anything named Turing or Worker. Uh, using grep on the command line. And this, this is available on Mac or Linux. On Windows, you might have to install the Windows subsystem for Linux or something like that to use nmap. And I can do that by saying nmap-sn uh, and then give it my network name. And on, on my computer, uh, the network is under 10.0.100. something. And so I can put in 10.0.100.1 slash 24. Your network is likely to be different than this. It might be 192.168 or 172.something. So your network might be different than this, uh, but this is just looking it up on my local network. Then I'm going to search for the different things that I named my Turing Pi compute modules. So for instance, grep uh, Turing, whoops, Turing, uh, or I'm also going to search for the term worker. And this is going to find all the Turing Pies on my network. And I just realized I don't actually have them running. So this is actually not going to do anything at all. I mean, it's not going to find anything. This is pretty ridiculous. Let's, let's try this again. And this is going to narrow down the list to just the Turing Pies that it finds. So here's the Turing Master, uh, Worker 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 that I set up. Uh, so I'm going to take this report and I'm going to put it in a text editor just so that I can uh, format the list for my own own use. And so now I know what the IP addresses for all these devices are. The first time I set up a cluster, I usually connect to each one manually just to make sure that I can connect with SSH. When I flashed it, I put my SSH key onto the card, my public key, but I'm going to make sure that I can connect using that SSH key so I can automate my connections. So I'm going to say SSH uh, pirate is the default user on Hyperit. Uh, and then pirate at 10.0.100.37. And the first time you connect, it might also ask you for a host key verification. And if it does, you can just type in YES or YES and then hit enter, and then it'll accept that host key from the server. Host keys are used to verify that your computer is connecting to the same server every time so that someone else couldn't set up a server and you connect to it, and then it takes your private data from you. Uh, so I'm going to connect to this one and make sure that it's running. Uh, close out of there. I'm going to connect to the next one, dot seventy. Make sure that it's running. I'll, I can exit out of there. So now I know that I can connect to all these Raspberry Pis, and my computer will be able to manage them, because if I can connect with SSH, then I can use a utility like Ansible to orchestrate all of these servers and connect to them and install things on them. Once you confirm all the servers are running and able to be accessed, it's finally time to install Kubernetes. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We have all these pies running, but I'd forgive you if you're a little like the kid in The Incredibles. Well, what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing, I guess. Just like with a single pie, there are seemingly infinite possibilities with a cluster of Raspberry Pis. But we need software to make it easier to run applications on the cluster without having to log into each Pi every time that we do it. And one bit of clustering software that's become extremely popular is Kubernetes. But what the heck is Kubernetes? Excuse me, sir, can you help me? I have Kubernetes. What's that? Kubernetes. Uh, sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. 
Well, I put together this little animation for a presentation I did last year at Flyover Camp in Kansas City, Missouri in the USA. At the very basic level, you have applications you want to run, like a CMS, a database, a chat system, search, Redis caching, and then you have a bunch of servers, in this case, Raspberry Pis, that you want to run all these things on. Kubernetes takes all those applications and gets them running on your servers and then keeps them running on your servers, even when there's trouble. That's about the most basic description possible, because a Kubernetes cluster can do a whole lot more and can be very complicated for large-scale cluster computing. But for basic needs, Kubernetes isn't as daunting as you might think. So let's install Kubernetes. Simple, right? We'll just go to the Kubernetes website, download it, install it. Easy peasy, all done. Well, not so fast. As with all things in life, installing Kubernetes can be a little bit complicated, mainly because there are many different flavors of Kubernetes you can install. Each one has its own benefits and drawbacks, just like with different Raspberry Pi OSs like Raspbian and Hyperiot OS. There are large-scale enterprise Kubernetes flavors like OpenShift or the full Kubernetes stack, and there are more lightweight trimmed-down Kubernetes flavors like K3S by Rancher or MicroKates by Canonical. And these are only a few of the many options. The full Kubernetes installation runs on a Raspberry Pi, but only barely. I've run it on my clusters and, and found that sometimes Kubernetes would start failing on Pis that only had one gigabyte of memory, like the compute modules do. And all the services that run with a full Kubernetes installation take a toll on a mobile CPU like the one in the Raspberry Pi. A distribution of Kubernetes like OpenShift has a ton of great features for usability, but it comes at a cost. At a minimum, you need three master servers running with 16 gigabytes of RAM each. Not going to happen with our little Raspberry Pis. MicroKates and K3S both run on lighter weight hardware, but K3S focuses more on the extreme end of lightweight and is easier to set up with more advanced configurations for HA or high availability. And then, when you finally choose a distribution of Kubernetes, you realize there are dozens of ways to actually install it. You could use kubeadmin or kubeadm on the command line to set up a cluster, or you could use the AWS CLI to build an Amazon EKS cluster. You could install a cluster with Terraform or Ansible or run something like KubeSpray. If it seems like there's a lot of similar options when you're researching things with Kubernetes, well, it's because there are. There are often too many ways, in my opinion, to do something with Kubernetes, and it can be overwhelming. Just look at all these tools that are highlighted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. This group maintains Kubernetes, and these are all the things that they say are part of the Kubernetes Cloud Native landscape. In our case, I'm going to stick with K3S. It runs great on Raspberry Pis, and it installs really fast. So let's go to the K3S website and work on getting it set up. Some people might go here and think, oh, th this is good. I can just copy this command and paste it on my Raspberry Pi, and then I can connect. And technically, you can do this. You could do that on your master Pi, and then do it on some other ones, and then try to do some other things to get them connected together. But there's a lot of manual steps. And as you saw, just connecting to each one, it takes a long time to connect to every Pi and manage it that way. So instead, we're going to use Ansible which lets us manage all the Raspberry Pis with one Ansible playbook that will connect to all of them, install K3S on them. And uh, Rancher actually maintains a K3S Ansible playbook. So I'm going to go to that now, K3S Ansible. On here, it has instructions for how to use the playbook. Uh, and basically, you set up a list of your hosts. So in, in my case, I have these hosts here that I'm going to put into this file. And then you run this Ansible playbook, and it's going to do the work of installing K3S on your Raspberry Pis and setting up the Kubernetes cluster. So we're going to do that now. The first step is downloading this repository. You can also clone it if you know how to use Git. Uh, but I'm just going to download the repository to my computer. That puts it into the Downloads folder. And if I open it up, it's right here, and it gives me these files. And the README for K3S Ansible tells me to put everything into hosts.ini. So here's the host.ini file. I'm actually going to open everything up in my text editor so that I can see things a little bit easier here. So I'm going to go to inventory, host.ini, and these are the pre-configured examples that it has. But I'm going to put my Turing Pi Master in here. So I'm going to grab it and replace that one. And I'm going to put all these nodes in. So I'll, I'll do them in order. Here's worker one. 
and finally worker six. And you might be wondering, why don't I just put in the host names here instead of the IP addresses? And I could do that. I could put Turing master, and I could put worker 01 instead of its IP and do all that. Uh, the one thing that I always keep in mind when I'm building infrastructure is IP addresses are gold because they usually don't change. That They don't always not change, but they usually don't change. So I'm going to use IP addresses here. And I've saved this file. And now I can go... I, I also need to check on one more thing under group vars all.yaml. I want to make sure that I'm using the right settings here. So I need to use the Ansible user, which is um, pirate instead of Debian, which is the default there. And then I think that's all that I'll need to change here. Uh, so everything is set up here. And I'm going to run this playbook. While it's running, I will show you how it works a little bit. Uh, if you if you want to get deeper into Ansible and how Ansible works, I have a whole YouTube series on my YouTube channel called Ansible 101, and, and there's a playlist for it as well. Uh, and I'll link you to the first video so that you can go watch that if you're interested in learning more about automation with Ansible. But I'm going to go to Downloads, uh, into K3S Ansible Master, and I'm going to run that command, which is Ansible Playbook, site.yaml, and then give it the inventory file with the dash i inventory slash host.ini. So I'm going to go ahead and kick that off. And that's going to start connecting to all the Raspberry Pis and downloading K3S to them and making sure they're running correctly. While that's going on, I'll show you what it's doing. This is an Ansible playbook. It's pretty simple. Uh, first, it, it runs some commands on all of the hosts. It runs this role pre prereq, which is some prerequisites to install K3S, making sure the settings are correct on the Raspberry Pis. Uh, it's going to download K3S using the download role. And then it's going to install a few tweaks for Raspbian if we're running Raspbian, which we aren't. We're running, we're running Hypriot, uh, but Hypriot might also need some of the tweaks that it that's going to going to install. Uh, after that, it, after it runs those three roles on all the cluster hosts, it's going to run just on the master, which we just have one master, the master role for K3s, and then it's going to run on all the nodes, the node role for K3s. And those roles are all listed in here, so you can see there's prereq is prereq, download is download, and one of those looks just like this. There's some tasks that are Ansible tasks. For example, it makes sure that uh, if, if a file uh, called K3S is already there, it's, it's gone. Um, it's going to download K3S, uh, the, right, the right version for the, whatever platform we're using. In our case, we're using ARM 32-bit, so it should use this one. Uh, then it's going to do some Raspbian tweaks, and the K3S roles are both in here. On the master, uh, it does a few different things, setting up K3S and uh, getting the token so that you can join nodes to the master and build this cluster. Uh, and then on the nodes, it's going to run some tasks that basically get K3S running and uh, connect the node to the master server. So we'll let that finish up and see how it works. All right, so at the end of that playbook run, it looks like everything was successful. Ansible didn't report any failures at all. So we should be good to go, and the cluster should be up and running. So I'm going to check on that by running this command to copy the cube config file into my local workstation. So I'm going to do that here. Uh, that's not that right command. Let me try copying and pasting again because sometimes I'm really bad at that. Uh, so I'm going to log in as pirate at uh, the master node IP, which is here. And I'm going to copy its cube config, and I'm going to copy it locally to a file called q.cube slash config turing pi, like that. That copies that cube config file down. And then you'll need to install and set up kubecuddle, or as I like to call it sometimes, cube control. You'll need to make sure that this is installed on your computer, and you can install it many different ways. There's a guide on this website uh, on my Mac. What I did was I used brew, so I used brew install kubecuddle, 
And then after that, you can run this command to make sure that it is installed correctly. And it says that there's missing or incomplete config info. That's because I have not set this cube config file as my default. And to do that, I'm going to say export cube config equals uh, home directory slash dot cube slash config turing pi. And now if I run this command, it should give me the right information. So it's seeing that my client is 1.18 and the server that the Turing Pi is running is 1.17. And I should be able to connect now and see the status of all the nodes if I say cube control get nodes. And I can see I have all of these nodes ready and running. And they've been up for two minutes and 30 seconds about. And my cluster is ready to start deploying applications. When you're finished working on the Raspberry Pis, it's a good idea to make sure they're all shut down before you unplug them. So to do that, there's a few different ways you can. The easiest way though, since we're already using Ansible for this, is to use Ansible's ad hoc task capabilities. So I'm gonna use a command called Ansible and then tell it to work on all the servers in the inventory slash host.ini file. And then I'm gonna say uh, dash A shut down now and then dash B, and this means uh, send the command shut down now to all the servers and use become user. That means use the root user, use sudo. Uh, otherwise, it won't let you run the shutdown command. And if I run this, it's going to send that command off to all the Raspberry Pis and Ansible reports failure because the Pi goes away when you shut it down. And the connection is, of course, refused. But you can see that each of the Pis is shut down now. And now it's safe to unplug your Turing Pi cluster and you can move it or do whatever you need to at this point. So now we have a running Kubernetes cluster. That's great. But again, we come back to the question, what can we do with it? Well, for that, you'll have to wait for the next episode where I'll deploy some applications to the cluster and show you some of the amazing things you can do with the Turing Pi cluster running K3S. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And if there's anything I missed, or if you have any questions about the Turing Pi and clustering, please feel free to ask in the comments below. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.